Hi everyone. I am glad to be with you today on this March 10th day in the supposed year of 2017 at 5.36 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to be continuing my series on worldviews, circumstantial worldviews, because I think that if you're anything like me, you have spent a lifetime thus far, no matter what your age is, minus 42, um, and in opposition to deep thought from A Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, 42 is not the secret to life and the universe and everything. And I can tell you that for a fact, because I am 42. And if you're, you're anything like me, you've spent your life thus far being entertained to death and pleasured to death. Um, you have oftentimes learned a type of language in order to just fit in with the people that you have to go to school with or work with or go to church with. It is a language of regurgitating pop culture in order to somehow find a common ground with your fellow man. It is a sad, sad state of existence we find ourselves in. <laughs> That's why I don't believe that... Well, never mind. Let's say this. I don't believe that we are living entirely in a dystopic 1984 existence. It's more like a very smooth blend of 1984 and Brave New World, in which we are just pleasured into oblivion. One theologian said about a century ago, and I believe it was, yeah, all right, don't freak out. I believe it was C.S. Lewis, and yes, we have our own big set of issues with Clive Staples Lewis, this is true. But you know, if a lunatic shouts 2 plus 2 equals 4, not only do I have to admit he's a lunatic, but I also have to admit he's right. C.S. Lewis, I believe it was, said that it is not the lack of pain that removes the, the meaning from our lives. Or it is not the lack of pleasure. See, I botched it immediately. <laughs> he said it's not the lack of pleasure. Um that removes the meaning from our lives, that makes our lives unmeaningful. It is the lack of pain that makes our lives devoid of meaning. And he's right about that. And believe me, I, I am not some masochist who, who longs for pain. But, I am... I am willing to live the life that the Most High has willed for me to live in Christ. And if that should naturally come with pain, and it ought, and it should, then that is the life that I would rather live. Because at least it's living. So we've, we've all been 
we've all been pleasured to death. I mean, there's no lack of entertainment. Even from the time I was a kid, in the late 70s and 80s, we still had a lot of entertainment. There was still always the television going, and then VCRs, and later DVDs, and CDs, and now MP3s, and everybody's got a smartphone and earbuds and can listen to any kind of entertainment they want to 24-7. With all that stimuli that we have all the time, and I'm going to admit, I listen to YouTube videos or whatever other audio recordings that I can find of substance just about all day long while I'm working, because most of my work I can do without having to really focus my thoughts on the work I'm doing, or at least I have the ability, or I've convinced myself I have the ability, to block out the audio that's coming through my earbuds when I have to, to think about what I'm doing, you know, and then can go back to it. But the fact remains, we're overstimulated with all kinds of mostly unedifying junk. We don't really have time or the desire to define our worldviews, to define what we believe based on the evidence that we have gathered, what this world is the nature of it, who is running it, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, what is the fullness of this creation? Um, what are our parameters that we believe exist based on what literature we believe is true? Most people never take the time to sketch those things out in their own mind. Most of us don't spend that quiet time we desperately need. And this now I am speaking to specifically the people that listen to me that are Christians, which I couldn't imagine why a lot of or any non-Christians would want to listen to me. I would not think I would be remotely enjoyable to listen to if you are not a Christian. Um, it doesn't seem that we really value the being able to put aside time daily for quiet thought, reading, specifically the Bible, doing word studies, digging, digging around in what information we have, and we've got tons of it. We've got so much information that we can dig through. It is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, you know, from what little I know about the deep web... It is said that the information that we have, that we get through in any common website that's listed with search engines like Google, Yahoo, uh, Bing, things like that, that that actually, they say, they say that that, <clears throat> that all represents only uh, a surface layer of what electronic information is actually out there and attainable. Now, concerning the rest of what I've heard about the deep web, honestly, I'm not that interested. Be just because of all of the oh, terrible, horrible, things that I've heard are made available on the deep web. Disgusting, inhuman, sickening 
things that that people film and take photos of that people get a thrill out of watching it's it's nauseating although i'm sure that those unlike me who are very computer savvy and I guess know how to use Tor to find information that it's not more easily findable on the regular uh, surface level web then, then they would find that a great tool I'm sure but not me, not now, I've got quite enough information right now that I can access through the surface web that I'm not going to get through anytime soon. Secondly, the Word of God, what we have of it, is extremely <clears throat> sufficient for anyone seeking the truth, wisdom, and knowledge of their God, their Creator, their Lord and Savior. So it's not like we have any shortage of information to pull from to develop worldviews. Now, by, by the time I'm done with this series, and what I've been doing is between the days that I have written on my weekly schedule to make videos, between those days, I am really trying to consider or bring back to mind because it, these things, these thoughts tend to hit me at odd times and sometimes I don't remember, but to bring back to mind those issues that I want to bring up to consider in sculpt, <clears throat> sculpting a worldview and then uh, hopefully when I'm I'm through with these things <clears throat> all of these points can come together and hopefully a, a full, well-rounded worldview will emerge from all of it. That's my hope. And, and that's why I've encouraged anyone who is listening to these things to do the same thing. Figure out what your worldview is. Do you have a worldview? Sit down and write out points uh, about life, about the creation, about this existence, about science, philosophy, whatever those things are that you believe and consider them, consider their validity, um, their source, what your impressions are. Um, and if you are uh, a son or daughter of the Most High, which I hope you are, these things will all revolve around Him, His only begotten Son, Jesus, and His Word that He has given us through His prophets, and in these last days, through his son. Because I don't think that most of us really have a developed worldview. And I think we ought to have one. Now, there are, are other people that very strongly share this particular worldview that I'm going to talk about today. If any of you are actually looking at this video instead of just listening to it, you will see that the somewhat gaudy structure that is on the screen in a really beautiful, almost, you know, widescreen panoramic photograph is St. Peter's Basilica, the Vatican. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, mostly. I'm going to talk about 
what the Vatican represents, who they are in relationship to the world and you and me, what exists there, and what can we understand about this system of Roman Catholicism and what role they not only have played in the past in the world, but that they play right now. And we're going to have to talk about the United States and what role they play because anyone who has a pulse understands that the United States is currently the country who enforces its will on every other country in the world except the Vatican. And we're going to talk about that. There is not nearly enough time to really cover all the facets of this particular worldview. This is not even close to enough time. But one thing I hope we will be able to, we're going to have to discuss, is who's ruling the world. Who's pulling the strings? Who's in charge? Because there is now, and has been for a little while now, a controversy between who, who is it? Who's pulling the strings? Who's in power? And we're going to have to we're going to have to consider these things and come to a conclusion. I don't think the conclusions are as, in some ways, in some ways, they're not as black and white as we would like them to be. But in other ways, they are in stark black and white. And so hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll accomplish drawing some lines here of demarcation to, um, to just sculpt and grasp a more complete worldview. As, as I said, there are, there are a number of people out there. There's not a lot of them, though. It's a minority that believe as I do concerning the Vatican and the Vatican's agents and their role in world affairs and politics. Now, I'm going to pose to you that the Bible itself tells us who's in charge of this world's system right now, who has the ultimate temporal control right now, as in who is the direct agent of Satan in this world, not who ultimately has all authority in this world, because it's Jesus who has all authority in heaven and on earth, but the Father told him to sit at his right hand until he has made his enemies his footstool, and that's the time that we're in right now. So, I believe that it's very clear, and we can prove with the Bible, who's running things, the history of the world, and how and why we find ourselves in the state we're in, and where it's all going. So, with that in mind, and now that you know where I'm going with this, let's go ahead and move forward with... The Vatican, Rome, Roman Catholicism, the papacy, what role does it play in world affairs or has it played in the history of world affairs? So in order to do this right, 
we're going to have to start. Uh, not here, whatever that is. Uh, it's a pop-up ad. Love those. Oh, okay. We're going to have to start in Daniel. And Daniel, when King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had besieged Jerusalem and taken the city, he carried off many people to Babylon uh, that dwelt there. So they would have been Judeans. But he he sacked a number of cities and, and regions around there. Some, some he left um, with the regent or king that he installed there, and, and many went. In fact, the prophet Jeremiah um, was told by Yahweh to tell the people, because they were resisting. They were resisting. They really thought that uh, their false prophets who were telling them that uh, they would not be overtaken by the king of Babylon, they really thought that they were going to be able to remain in Jerusalem and, and keep their independence. And Jeremiah went through a lot of very bad times because he was prophesying correctly by the word of Yahweh. He told the people, he said, this is what Yahweh says, go to Babylon go there and establish houses and businesses settle down there pray for the king and pray for the leaders of babylon that's what yahweh told the people to do so a lot of them who were carried off including daniel and his three friends which were renamed shadrach meshach and abednego that was not their original hebrew names daniel was also renamed balthasar they were um of sort of the um well sort of the nobles in jerusalem they they were well-educated, young. Um, it even says that they were they were good-looking. They were well-spoken. So these were the people that uh, Nebuchadnezzar decided he wanted in his court, and he would have them trained and um, conditioned, very much like the rest of his court magicians, the the Chaldeans. So there's a number of things that happen, and the book of Daniel records uh, instances that happen over a, a long period of time, in fact, because Daniel was a became a very high official, not only in the Babylonian kingdom, but he became a very valued official in the new kingdom uh, of Cyrus and the Medo-Persians when they sacked the city after the 70 years that Yahweh told them that they would be in exile. So early on in their stay, King Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream. Now, the thing that horrified Nebuchadnezzar is he could not remember his dream. It is said that the king of nations like Babylon, they were expected to recall things like dreams and, and interpret those things because traditionally, ancient pagan kings have been considered as... Um, <clears throat> offspring of the gods it would have been an extremely bad thing let's just say that Nebuchadnezzar knew he had an extremely important dream and he couldn't remember it and it was vexing him he asked for the magicians the soothsayers the Chaldeans to tell him his dream and interpret his dream 
and of course they kept saying to him tell us your dream and we'll interpret and he was telling them no if you're worth your salt as a, ma a magician soothsayer medium whatever these people were in their dark arts if you're worth your salt you'll tell me the substance of my dream and its interpretation and of course none of them could and the king was at the point of he was going to kill everyone who worked for him as a I guess if you want to say a court magi all of them including Daniel and his friends so Daniel having wisdom he prayed to Yahweh he and his friends fasted and Yahweh gave him the dream and the interpretation so we'll start with when Daniel tells the dream to Nebuchadnezzar um, the king answered Daniel Daniel answered the king okay starting in 27 Daniel answered the before the king and said the secret which the king has demanded can neither wise men enchanters magicians or soothsayers show to the king but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days your dream and the visions of your head on your bed are these as for you O king your thoughts came into your mind on your bed what should happen hereafter and he who reveals secrets has made known to you what shall happen but as for me this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living but to the intent that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart you O king saw and behold a great image this image which was mighty and whose brightness was excellent stood before you and its aspect was awesome as for the image its head was of fine gold its breast and arms of silver its belly and its thighs of brass its legs of iron its feet part of iron and part of clay you saw until a stone was cut without hands which struck the image on its feet that were of iron and clay and broke them in pieces then was the iron the clay the brass the silver and the gold broken in pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that no place was found for them and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this is the dream and we will tell its interpretation before the king you O king are king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom the power and the strength and the glory and wherever the children of men dwell the animals of the field and the birds of the sky has he given into your hand and has made you to rule over them all you are the head of gold after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to you and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron because iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things and as iron that crushes all these shall it break in pieces and crush whereas you saw the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron it shall be a divided kingdom but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron because you saw the iron mixed with miry clay as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken 
whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cling one to another, even as iron does not mingle with clay. In the days of those kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Because you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall happen hereafter, and the dream is certain, and its interpretation, sure. That's where we start with world history from that time forward. Now, before Yahweh had made Babylon into that great world power, there were two massive empires and dynasties before that which had ruled over the known earth. And when I say the known earth, remember, everything in the Bible is written from the perspective of how world affairs and peoples interact with the people of God. In the Old Testament, it was the Hebrews, which were the 12 tribes of Israel, which then became more condensed into the southern tribes of Judah after he had divorced the northern tribes and had them carried off. Then it was those southern tribes, which was mostly Judah and Benjamin with Levi, then, when Cyrus sacked Babylon and killed the sitting king, the spoiled brat Belshazzar, and he decreed that all of those being of Israeli stock could then return to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and the wall, there was a very small remnant who chose to do this in all of his provinces. And the provinces of Persia were huge, widespread, but only a remnant returned. Now, of that remnant, and those that Yahweh had not forgotten about throughout all of the kingdoms that uh, Persia had control over and then Greece had control over, he hadn't completely, he had not forgotten about his people, and he would keep his word to them. He would still bring the message of his Messiah, who is also exactly prophesied about in Daniel chapter 9, to these people as well. And after his Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, was resurrected, his apostles went out and brought their message not only to all of the scattered peoples of Israel, but also Paul brought his message of redemption and salvation to all people of all races, so that the two people the one being the remnant of Israel and Judah, the other people being the nations, would now become one holy people bearing the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his 
only begotten Son, his Messiah, Jesus the Anointed of Nazareth. And so in the New Testament, forward till our very day, the prophecies that we have of the end times are following God's people who are now and have been for some time a new holy nation made up of Jew and Gentile together one one people in Jesus Christ that is the continuation of Israel made up of all peoples of the 12 tribes of Israel and many many Gentiles as well so we have to remember that when speaking of history and world events there were other empires in the world at these times other kingdoms in the world at these times but the ones that we want to pay particular attention to are the ones that have the most impact on the people of Yahweh before Babylon there was first the great empire of Egypt and it was a great empire and it was a world empire it did become a great vast world empire we, we find Egyptian relics in the United States in caves in the Grand Canyon and now a number of people say that the Egyptians actually subcontracted um, the Minoans and uh, Phoenicians to do their sailing for them that's very possible but they were still doing their traveling and their sailing and their acquiring of all kinds of goods uh, peoples services precious metals and resources around the world in the name of Egypt the next great empire after Egypt was Assyria Assyria grew into an empire while Egypt was yet a very powerful empire and there does exist evidence in the Bible that Assyrian kings ruled on the throne of Egypt in the book of Isaiah it says concerning the children of Israel that it was the Assyrian who oppressed them there if you remember in Exodus it says that a king arose who did not know Joseph so the Assyrians were also rising to power in the shadow of Egypt now that shouldn't surprise anyone that's been done throughout the ages to this day where kingdoms think about the um, think about for instance if any of you are familiar with the story of the lion in winter an English king marries a French noblewoman because he wants access to her lands and her holdings that she had rights to same thing it's been going on for thousands of years more quote-unquote royal families marry into royal families I mean most people out there by now know that the Queen of England is German so Assyria was growing <clears throat> in power as Egypt was continuing their great world um, domination after the Exodus when Yahweh killed Pharaoh and his army in the Red Sea after the ten plagues 
which decimated Egypt. And it's, you have to figure, it had to have just smashed their economy. I mean, the events leading up to the Exodus, I think, was Egypt's downfall. I, that's why after Pharaoh and his army are drowned in the Red Sea, we don't hear about Egypt. Those 40 years that, that, that Israel is, is in the wilderness. And in fact, news has gone all over the world now concerning what Yahweh did in Egypt for his people, Israel. That's exactly why Yahweh said to Pharaoh, this is why I raised you up. So I could show my glory, my, my power, my strength to the world. He would establish his name and his reputation in the world with what he did in Egypt. And he did. So now there was a vacuum because of what he had done to Egypt. And in that vacuum, over time, I think there were a number of kingdoms that were very uneasy and warring with one another um, but what happened over time was that the Assyrian kingdom gained a great deal of strength and they had uh, a very large birth uh, as well as as Egypt did, concerning the lands that they had actively conquered and places that they had controlled. So they were the second great kingdom of the world. And of course, I'm not counting any of the kingdoms that may have existed in the antediluvian world. We don't really know hardly anything about that. We're talking about everything we know after that. Yahweh made made sure that we did not have much information concerning that world. And I'm sure for a very good reason. Egypt, Assyria, and now Babylon. And in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, it accounts for, starting with Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and after Rome there would be a division. There would be this division of ten great powers, not like Rome, but partly weak, partly strong. Those ten divisions would be what existed when that rock smashes into the feet and turns that entire statue to nothing. Now, if we were to look at just that, and that is God's kingdom, Christ bringing God's kingdom, if we were to look only at that dream, we would definitely be for quite some time scratching our heads wondering about the interpretation of it but we don't have to we have more if we go to Daniel chapter 7 we have a dream that Daniel had during the time of Belshazzar this would have been when Daniel was a an old man pretty much um, because this would have been closer to the end of Israel's captivity when Nebuchadnezzar's dream was close to the beginning. Their Babylonian captivity was 70 years. So we've got many decades in between that first dream of Nebuchadnezzar's in Daniel 2 to this dream that he has and he, he records in Daniel chapter 7. This is going to be a complementary vision to the one that Nebuchadnezzar had that Yahweh gave Daniel the vision of and the interpretation of. 
and this is really going to help clarify a lot for us. So I'm going to have to read all of seven, and yeah, I'm 45 minutes in already, so I'm afraid this one is going to have a few parts to it. There's just no way around it. You don't approach the issue of who's running the world and how can we prove that through scripture and world events and think that you're really going to get that covered within an hour, hour and a half. Some people with a lot more talent who don't run off at the mouth like I do, maybe they could do it. I don't think so, but maybe. This is a can of worms. It's not something that just gets settled quickly. There's so much to it. When you start dealing with history, ugh, it's intimidating because it's massive. It's massive and it's complex. And you've got to be brilliant to try to condense the complexity of history into an easy to understand timeline of events which ones were the most important, which players were the most important, uh, to where your listener can understand and apply that to their current existence. Now you see, this is what's so brilliant about our God, Yahweh. He does it. He does it over and over again. Here we're going to see in Daniel. We, we see it in Zechariah. Um, we have visions of these things throughout different major and minor prophets. And of course, we have the grand uh, opus symphony of the apocalypse, the revelation of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. And of course, only our God, our great God, can take history and can boil it down into the most appropriate points, sp specific as it relates to his people. Give that to us in symbols, thus code, and then give us all of the materials plus the Holy Spirit to be able to decipher such code, and not in some easy way, like we're just going through a, a typical cipher. His word is absolutely complex in the best, most fantastically awesome way I can say. So that's what we have. That's why no other religious book comes close, comes close to the brilliance and the magnificence that is what we have in our scriptures today. So, let's do Dan Daniel chapter 7 and get a more in-depth look at these latter-day kingdoms. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head on his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the sky broke forth on the great sea. Four great animals came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion, and had eagle's wings. I saw until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made to stand on two feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Behold, another animal, a second like a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And they said to, thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I saw, and behold, another like a leopard, 
which had on its back four wings of a bird. The animal also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth animal, awesome and powerful and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. And it was diverse from all the animals that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. I saw until the thrones were placed, and one who was ancient of days sat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands of thousands ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I saw at that time, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I saw even until the animal was slain, and its body destroyed, and it was given to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the animals, their dominion was taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, there came with the clouds of the sky one like a son of man. And he came even to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. There was given him dominion, and glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was grieved in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great animals, which are four, are four kings, who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom, and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I desired to know the truth concerning the fourth animal, which was diverse from all of them, exceedingly terrible, whose teeth were of iron and its nails of brass, which devoured, broke in pieces, and stamped the residue with its feet, and concerning the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three fell, even that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake great things, whose look was more stout than its fellows. I saw, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, The fourth animal shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom shall ten kings arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the former, and he shall put down 
three kings. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And he shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, and times, and half a time. But the judgment shall be set, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and to, to destroy it to the end, the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole sky shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Here is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts much troubled me, and my face was changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Now, after this, <clears throat> in the book, Daniel is going to record other visions. And those other visions are going to be of what happens in the time of Persia. Persia is overthrown by Greece, Alexander the Great, and his kingdom is quickly divided into four sub-kingdoms, his four generals. Daniel 8, Daniel 10, 11, 12 tells these things in detail. But Daniel 7 and Daniel 2 tell us about four great kingdoms that shall be in the earth. And that last kingdom shall exist in some certain way until the Ancient of Days brings in his kingdom, which, as I said, is ushered in by the coming of his son and all his saints, and this kingdom shall last forever. Now we're given a number of visions in Daniel, and I would say based on just the material of Daniel, and then we have complementary visions from some of the prophets who existed after the time of Daniel, um, during the time of the remnant returning to Jerusalem. Uh, specifically, Zechariah is a very complementary book. So, that was enough material for anyone who wanted to study the Word of God and how history would play out in the last days. It would be plenty of material for anybody who wanted to do that to keep doing that for the next 400 years, 500 years, in fact. You know, they call that time between Malachi and the coming of the Christ the silent years, but there's nothing silent about them. Daniel filled in those gaps rather well, including probably, no, definitely the darkest days of that interim period being the, being the rule of the Seleucids uh, with its zenith being um, the, the tyranny of Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. So now we can pick up in Revelation. John is given this revelation while he's on the island of Patmos because of persecution, because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of content in Revelation up to the point where we're going to start at, but we're going to stay with the motifs that we've seen thus far in Daniel. Now, 
Daniel picks up, I'm sorry, John picks up here in Revelation 12 by telling us about a vision he sees in heaven. He says in Revelation 12, 1, a great sign was seen in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child. She cried out in pain, laboring to give birth. Another sign was seen in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven crowns. His tail drew one-third of the stars of the sky and threw them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she gave birth he might devour her child. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared by God, that there they may nourish her 1,260 days. This time measure comes up again and again. Now, these videos, I, I might get into why we can be confident in using a day-year principle with these time measures, but there does exist significant biblical reason for why we can do that in prophecy, specifically apocalyptic prophecy. So what now becomes interesting is that this dragon that we see bears a certain resemblance to the fourth beast that we see from Daniel 7, but is not exactly like that fourth beast. And like I said, John interprets that dragon as being the devil and Satan. But there's reasons why the devil and Satan are pictured in Revelation 12 as a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. Because we're going to see this again manifested in the next chapter. And we're going to be able to apply... the fourth beast that we see in Daniel chapter 7 and attributes of the red dragon that we see in Revelation 12 to the beast, the first beast that we see in Revelation 13. And then when we get to Revelation 18, we have a very similar beast. And actually, a lot about the beast is told to John that helps us understand why we're seeing Satan in this form in Revelation 12, why we see this certain specific beast in Revelation 13, and what exactly we're seeing in Revelation 17 and 18, where we see this scarlet colored beast with a whore riding atop it. Now, right now, I'm not going to go too much through Revelation 12, but Revelation 12 echoes very much some details that we already read in Daniel chapter 7. But in Revelation 13, now this beast we want to pay some attention to, just like the fourth beast in Daniel 7, and specifically the little horn on the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. So in Revelation 13, starting in verse 1, <clears throat> Then I stood on the sand of the sea. That's very much like Daniel. John said, I stood on the stand, sand, of the st st <laughs> sand of the sea. I saw a beast coming up out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads. On his horns were ten crowns, and on his heads blasphemous names. The beast which I saw was like a leopard, 
His feet were like those of a bear, his mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. One of his heads looked like it had been wounded fatally. His fatal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled at the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? A mouth speaking great things and blasphemy was given to him. Authority to make war for forty-two months was given to him. He opened his mouth for blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his dwelling, those who dwell in heaven. It was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation was given to him. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been killed. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, he will go into captivity. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, he must be killed. Here is the endurance and the faith of the saints. Now there's two other visions in Revelation in which we're going to see beasts. I hope that thus far you've seen that with beasts, beasts are kingdoms. Now I'm going back <laughs> real quick because I, I would not want to really continue this without really pointing this out to you. Now consider the dream of Nebuchadnezzar from Daniel 2. And let's go over Daniel 7, just at the, the first portion when he sees the four beasts. Remember, he told Nebuchadnezzar straight out that those kingdoms, there was the head of gold, there was the arms and breast of silver, there was the thighs of brass, there were the two legs of iron, then there was the feet of iron and clay, and the ten toes of iron and miry clay. He said those were all kingdoms. Straight up. Same thing with these beasts. It's not, it's not really a great mystery, it's, it's very plain. The first beast was Babylon. And it's fantastic, too, if you look at the symbols of ancient Babylon. It's a griffin with a man's head. Perfect, perfect illustration that Daniel gives here, that he sees this lion with the wings of an eagle. And he says he, he saw until the wings were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, I believe that speaks to the salvation of King Nebuchadnezzar and what was done to him. And he was really <clears throat> the great and last great king of Babylon. The next is Medo-Persia. It was like a bear. It was raised up on one side. Persia was far stronger than the Medes. And in fact, after the first couple of co-kings, with Cyrus being both Mede and Persian, um, after that initial bit, it was all Persian kings from there on out but this was a this was a conglomeration of media and persia 
it was raised up on one side and it had three ribs in its mouth and between its teeth because it had conquered three great kingdoms and those three ribs were those kingdoms it had conquered they are typically understood historically to be Egypt Babylonia and Lydia those three and it says arise devour much flesh the purge uh, as I said before the Persian kingdom stretched huge in the ancient world from east to west it was enormous it really was vast empire okay so the third one was like a leopard fast it had on its back four wings of a bird this is a fast aggressive animal the animal also had four heads four heads and dominion was given to it after this I saw in the night visions okay he's gonna say a fourth animal sorry Greece was extremely fast a very quick empire they would march amazing distances in one day they prided themselves on speed they conquered the Persian Empire which was pretty amazing and it's typically attributed to speed Alexander the Great after he conquered the Persian Empire he set up his capital in Babylon because the Persians still occupied Babylon he comes to Babylon he dies quite quickly of they say a great fever which quite possibly had a lot to do with the fact that he was what appears to be a blatant flaming homosexual maybe not flaming like a queen but he wasn't keeping it secret he divides his kingdom to his four generals essentially Cassander Lysimachus Ptolemy Seleucus and they really rule the known world until Rome the fourth kingdom the way he describes Rome is absolutely to a T he says the fourth animal was awesome and powerful and strong exceedingly and had great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces it stamped the residue with its feet it was diverse from all the animals that were before it and had ten horns I considered those horns and behold there came up among them another horn a little one before which three of the first were plucked up by their roots and behold in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things so he gives a great picture of Imperial Rome and how they conquered through brute strength massive numbers and they had an army that was not paralleled and the, the way that this beasts characteristics are described are totally accurate with ancient pagan Rome now very early on it would be towards the end of the time of the Flavians Rome as it spread out and diversified itself 
And we have this recorded in the earlier chapters of Revelation. Had to cope with different nations. They called barbarians because they called everybody who wasn't them barbarians. What this turned out to be within a couple hundred years was that Rome ended up being a kingdom subdivided into ten kingdoms. There were ten, I guess you could call them, barbarian tribes that existed in what today we would call Europe, which was the heart of the Roman kingdom. Before the emperor in the east, because Constantinople, the city of the east, which was established by Constantine, its emperor in the 6th century vested all the powers of the Pontifus Maximus into the hands of the Bishop of Rome. And when he did that, he started off a chain of events of world history that would last to this day. Before he did that, there were three of these barbarian kingdoms. There was the Ostrogoths, Vandals, Heruli. These three kingdoms fell before the Bishop of Rome was lawfully deemed Pontifus Maximus. And he became, I suppose in the eyes of the world, a sort of priest-king. Does that sound familiar? A priest-king. Three kingdoms fell of those ten. Now, ever since then, what's been called the Holy Roman Empire, and even on to this day, and we're going to have to get into the day that we're in, and the second beast of Revelation 13, and the United States, and the divisions of the world, before we're all done, but we have to be absolutely certain, solid certain, on the fact that when we see a beast in apocalyptic prophecy, it's not a man. It's not an individual. It's a kingdom. When we see heads, they can represent subdivisions of those kingdoms, Horns can represent subdivisions of those kingdoms. We see it repeated in Daniel 8, and um, besides for Daniel 8, we should be seeing it one more time. Yeah. In 8, we have the ram and the he goat, and that should give you a really good illustration of how horns are subdivisions of a kingdom. Um, hmm. Yeah, mostly Daniel 8 is where you'd have to refer to that to. So you're going to have to be 100% concrete on those things before you can get further and understand what the book of Revelation is telling us about the time from the first century when John was given this revelation to today 
and beyond today because we're going to have to establish who the ruling power is, how they rule, and what's going to be happening in this world, what we can expect, where we are in time and history. Like I said, this isn't something that I could do with one video. It's just not possible. It's way too big. It's huge. But that's something that we need to establish. This took me a couple of years to fully establish this. Who was in charge? Who was the Antichrist? Is the Antichrist synonymous with the Little Horn of Daniel? What are the roles of the beast? Is the Antichrist synonymous with the beast? If so, in what way? And what's and who is this second beast of Revelation 13? And who's the false prophet? And are they the same? And why? These are questions we're going to have to ask in order to get to the bottom of this worldview concerning who it is that's running this world today and how. So that's where I'm going to wrap it. I'll continue with this thought um, on the next video, and we're going to talk about those beasts in Revelation 13 and the beasts that we see in Revelation 17 and 18, and we're going to be applying it to the empires that currently hold power in this world, and we're going to talk a little bit about names and a little bit about history and... We're really going to have to feel around in the dark for some of this stuff, but it's exactly why I called these videos circumstantial worldviews, because unfortunately we're going to have to take a lot of circumstantial evidence and develop these worldviews. So I hope it's a good time. I really do hope that this kind of forces you to think about all of these things, develop your worldview. Come up with some answers and some questions that are beyond what I've thought up. And uh, like I've always said, and then teach me. Because um, that's what I'm after. Um, I'm, I'm out here doing this so that I can find those who have the same spirit of truth in them and passion for the Almighty God, His Christ, and His Word. That's that. So, anyways, till next time, just remember, Jesus is Lord, God's kingdom is forever, and I am your servant. Farewell.